Hey guys, just me again. We're going to put a trigger warning at the top of this episode because it deals with a sensitive subject and involves the sexual assault of a minor. If this isn't for you, no worries. Skip on ahead to another episode. Please take care while you're listening and protect your own mental health. Hey, welcome to Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We're Carly and Zach, and we're so glad you're here with us today. Today we're bringing you a special bonus episode, brought to you in collaboration with the folks over at the Legal Writers Collective. Go on and check them out on our website or at legalwriterscollective.com. Hope you enjoy! The Queen and AAG Court of Appeal for Ontario Heard in writing On appeal from the convictions entered on December 1, 2015 by Justice Timothy D. Ray of the Superior Court of Justice Reasons for Decision The appellant was convicted of multiple offenses arising from historical sexual assaults of S.M., the young daughter of his former common-law spouse, A.W., as well as physical assaults of A.W., S.M., and A.W.'s son, E.M. The appellant first met A.W. in 2001. Four months later, he moved in with her and her three children in their home in Surrey, British Columbia. S.M. was then aged 10, E.M. was 8, and A.X. was 6. A few months later, in 2002, the family packed into a panel van with improvised seating and traveled for a month to Ontario. They eventually settled in Ottawa after lengthy stays in Windsor and Niagara Falls. The household was characterized by dysfunction, rampant drug abuse, violence, and neglect. As they traveled, the family attracted the attention of local children's aid societies. At trial, SM testified to incidents of sexual abuse starting when the family lived in BC, escalating on the drive to Ontario and carrying on in the years subsequent. The incidents reported by SM included sexual touching, forced oral sex and vaginal intercourse, sometimes facilitated by forced consumption of marijuana or sleeping pills. The charges against the appellant all relate to incidents taking place in Ontario between January 1, 2003 and June 22, 2005. Once in Ontario, A.W. became increasingly incapacitated by her drug use, mostly keeping to her bedroom. She did not keep a close watch on S.M. Consequently, S.M. was frequently alone with the appellant. On the appellant's own evidence, he spent much more time with S.M. than the other children, and his attention to S.M. caused conflict with A.W. Even after he split from A.W. and moved out of the family's residence in Ottawa, he still walked S.M. to school. According to the appellant, he would sometimes take S.M. to the house where he was living instead of going to school if he thought her clothing was inappropriate for school. The appellant testified that S.M. missed approximately 50 days of school that year. S.M. testified to frequent sexual abuse during this time, including being forced to take crack, marijuana, and sleeping pills view pornography, and submit to the appellant's sex acts. In June 2005, SM contacted the Children's Aid Society from a shelter to report that she and her siblings were being neglected, without proper accommodation or food. The CAS apprehended the children on June 22, 2005, and placed them in foster care with supervised visits from their mother and the appellant. SM did not report sexual abuse to CAS at this time. After living in foster care in Ontario, SM moved in 2007 to the United States to live with her father. She testified that she began selective and partial disclosure of the sexual abuse to her mother and friends while in foster care. She wrote at length of the sexual abuse in a book as part of a grade 12 writing project. She subsequently reported the abuse to the police in Ottawa in 2012 through a written statement. E.M. and A.W. each also reported incidents of physical abuse by the appellant. The appellant was convicted of assault for an incident in which he choked A.W. and he was convicted of assault and assault with a weapon for hitting E.M. with sticks and a belt. With respect to S.M., the appellant was convicted of sexual assault, sexual interference, invitation to sexual touching, administering a stupefying or overcoming drug, and assault. 
the appellant appeals his conviction on the following ground. One, the trial judge applied the wrong standard in assessing SM's evidence. Two, the trial judge made improper use of the appellant's criminal record in assessing the appellant's credibility. Three, the trial judge failed to consider a number of material inconsistencies in the Crown's case in assessing credibility. Four, the trial judge applied different standards of scrutiny to Crown evidence than to defense evidence. And five, the trial judge erred in finding the rule in Brown and Dunn had been violated and in drawing an adverse inference against the appellant. Part A, Analysis. One, standard for assessing credibility of SM. SM was a 24-year-old woman at the time of trial, testifying about events that occurred when she was approximately 10 to 14 years old. The trial judge correctly noted that he was required to assess her credibility using the criteria applicable to adult witnesses. But in assessing her credibility, the trial judge was entitled to make allowances for errors attributable to the fact that she was recalling memories that were formed through the perceptions she had as a child, the Queen and W.R. Where such recollections appear faulty and the perceptions relate to peripheral matters, these faults need not negatively impact the trial judge's assessment of the witness. As is the case with most allegations of sexual assault against children, the outcome largely turned on the trial judge's assessment of the witnesses. The trial judge found SM to be credible. The trial judge did not, however, accept SM's evidence about the frequency of the sexual abuse that she was sexually abused every day on the trip from British Columbia, or that it was, quote, persistent, constant, and unrelenting thereafter, end quote. He accepted that it may have seemed to her as a child that sexual abuse was a daily occurrence, but that it probably was not daily. Ultimately, he accepted that the sexual assaults occurred in the way that SM described them, but, quote, perhaps with less frequency, end quote. He did not find this inaccuracy to be, quote, a marker of unreliability, but more likely a marker of the memory of a child, end quote. And he observed that she recalled, quote, without hesitation, in a chronological fashion, the events that occurred, end quote. The appellant argues that the trial judge erred in finding the frequency of alleged assaults to be a peripheral matter, and in not attributing more weight to SM's exaggeration in assessing her credibility. We do not agree. Trial judges are entitled to significant deference in assessing the credibility of witnesses from the Queen and Gagnon and the Queen and REM. SM's evidence was that the appellant was prolific in his abuse of her. The frequency with which the assaults were alleged to have happened was by no means a trivial matter, but in the context of historical offenses said to have occurred repeatedly over a period of several years, We cannot say that the trial judge erred in placing the weight he did on the complainant's characterization of the frequency of the abuse. 2. Use of the appellant's criminal record The trial judge noted the appellant's lengthy criminal record and found that the serious nature of some of those offenses, quote, not only go to the defendant's credibility, but also to the violence of many of his offenses, end quote. The appellant argues that the trial judge thereby wrongly used his criminal record for the prohibited purpose of reasoning that he likely committed the offenses because his record reflected a propensity to commit violent offenses. We do not agree. The trial judge did not reason that because the appellant had been convicted of violent offenses, he was for that reason a violent person and was therefore more likely to have committed the offenses. The trial judge rejected the appellant's evidence. He gave many reasons for doing so. Among these, the most important were the contradictory and evasive nature of much of his testimony, his refusal to concede clear errors in his testimony, his inability to remember past events with clarity, and what the trial judge perceived to be a lack of candor about having taken an illicit substance during the lunch break while he was testifying. The appellant's criminal record was an appropriate matter for the trial judge to consider in assessing credibility. The passage to which the appellant objects is a single half-sentence at the very end of a lengthy paragraph in which the trial judge assesses the appellant's credibility. It appears to be almost a footnote or afterthought and is not integrated into the trial judge's chain of reasoning. Furthermore, as the Crown argues, the appellant made his violent history central to his defense. In cross-examination of Crown witnesses, defense counsel repeatedly raised the issue of violence in the family home in order to highlight situations in which EM and SM 
spoke to police officers and CAS caseworkers, but did not disclose the allegations of abuse. Moreover, the defense advanced the theory that SM blamed the appellant for bringing violence, drug abuse, and chaos into her family, and she therefore fabricated these allegations against him as retribution. The trial judge's comment about the appellant's history of violence was not needed for his analysis and did not contribute to it. Nevertheless, it did not constitute a reversible error. 3. Material Inconsistencies The appellant argues that there are material inconsistencies in the evidence that the trial judge was obliged to resolve but did not. We do not agree. Many of the inconsistencies that the appellant identifies are more apparent than real, accounts that are in some respects different but not inconsistent. Some genuine inconsistencies that the appellant identifies relate to peripheral, non-material matters. A trial judge is entitled to deference in determining the significance to place on any inconsistencies in the evidence, particularly with respect to how those inconsistencies bear on the assessment of the credibility of witnesses. The appellant places particular emphasis on inconsistencies related to SM's disclosure of the sexual abuse to her mother. On A.W.'s account, in the telephone conversation where S.M. first disclosed that the appellant had sexually abused her, she only disclosed sexual touching. When A.W. pressed S.M. for more details by asking, did he do more than that? A.W.'s evidence was that S.M. said no, but, quote, it sounded like she didn't want to tell me more than what she knows, end quote. S.M.'s evidence was different. Question. You tell A.W. that the appellant used to touch you, right? Answer, yeah, and more. Question, well, how much detail did you get into? Answer, not too much, but I just stated the facts. Question, but not detail, just that he raped and molested you for years, right? Answer, yeah. The inconsistency is that SM agreed on cross-examination to the proposition that she told AW about having been repeatedly raped as well as molested, Whereas in A.W.'s account, she specifically asked S.M. if the appellant had done anything more than fondle her, and S.M. had said no. The trial judge clearly preferred the evidence of S.M. to A.W. He gave reasons for why he found A.W.'s evidence overall not to be particularly impressive at paragraph 89. In characterizing her evidence in this way, the trial judge made reference to her heavy drug use during the time of sexual abuse, which he found impacted her ability to observe events and accurately remember them. The appellant objects that the trial judge ought not to have discounted her testimony about the details of the conversation of SM's disclosure on the basis of her historical drug impairment, as by that time she had been sober for many years. But the trial judge did not reject all of AW's evidence, nor did he place undue weight on her historical drug use. His other basis for viewing her evidence with skepticism was her defensiveness at trial in response to the suggestion that she had been, and continued to be, a poor mother. On A.W.'s account, she interrogated S.M., seeking to pull the truth out of what the appellant did, while S.M. thwarted her efforts. On S.M.'s account, A.W. did not and was not receptive to what she was told. The trial judge was entitled to doubt A.W.'s credibility on matters that tended to put her parenting in a bad light. The appellant has not made out the claim that the trial judge did not consider material evidence when making credibility assessments. 4. Uneven scrutiny. A related ground of appeal is that the trial judge held the appellant's evidence to a more rigorous standard than that of SM. This ground of appeal is framed largely as a repetition of the arguments already rejected about the trial judge's failure to engage with material inconsistencies in the evidence and his preference of SM's evidence over the appellant's. For the reasons given above, the argument is rejected. Additionally, the trial judge gave lengthy reasons why he disbelieved the appellant's evidence. His evidence was internally inconsistent and contradictory. He was a heavy crack cocaine user at the relevant time, which affected his memory. He was stubborn and evasive. He appeared intoxicated while giving evidence, which he attempted to explain away as the effect of taking prescription medication over the lunch break while in custody, an explanation that was contradicted by police officials who had care of him at that time. The trial judge similarly gave lengthy reasons why he believed SM's account, including explaining why the evidence that he rejected did not impact on his finding that she was a credible witness. 
He drew on evidence of the appellant and A.W. that corroborated her account in several respects, particularly with respect to their evidence about an incident of inflammation of SM's vagina, which the trial judge accepted as corroborative of SM's account of sexual abuse by the appellant. The trial judge did not err in the manner in which he assessed the evidence of the witness. 5. Brown and Dunn There is no merit to the appellant's argument that the trial judge improperly applied the rule in Brown and Dunn to the detriment of the appellant. The remarks the trial judge made about Brown and Dunn during the trial were provisional and equivocal and made no appearance in his reasons for judgment. As canvassed above, the trial judge had ample reason to disbelieve the evidence of the appellant, and there was no indication in his reasons that he drew an adverse inference on the basis of a violation of the rule in Brown and Dunn. Even if he had drawn an adverse inference, it would have been entirely superfluous for him to have done so. Disposition. The appeal is dismissed. Thanks for the listen, friend. I hope you're able to enjoy that case and learn something new from it. Legal Listening is founded by Zach Battiston and Carly Lyons. It is hosted by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and you, our listeners. Executive produced by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and Anthony Rademile. Audio engineering by Anthony Rademile. Graphic design by Julie Lundy. Check her out online at julielundyart.com. And music done by Matt Rademile at radandkel.com. At Legal Listening, we're always open to new ideas, suggestions, and of course, guest readers. Check us out on Twitter at Legal Listening or online at legallistening.com. Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We'll catch you in the next case. Bye now.